Good morning, wrestling fans. Welcome to PWR today. It is Labor Day, September 5th, 2022. The Mandy Call Meet at the uh, Matthew Thomas, the third place finisher in the PWR Fantasy Draft of 2023. Uh, welcome. Uh, it is a wrestling weekend that we have a ton of results and news to go over. Matthew, how are you doing this morning? I'm good. This might have been the busiest wrestling weekend ever in the history of, of all time as far as major pay-per-views go. Now, I know you uh, come WrestleMania weekend, you got a lot of things to do, a lot of different companies running shows. But as far as stuff that people can watch on main uh mainstream professional wrestling companies this weekend might have been it man dude and not only that this is a heavy weekend for fantasy football drafting so there was a point sunday night i was behind on clash i'll be completely honest there's a point on sunday night i was watching two pay-per-views i was watching the clash and uh nxt worlds collide i was trying to draft my first team and try to cook dinner for the entire family what the hell? There was a clash of champions? A clash at the castle. Oh, of champions. Okay. It's a clash of pork chops and applesauce is what it was. Well, I mean, you are in Appleton, so. That's uh, right. You know, that's, and that's, I've always been the apple of your eye. Yes, you are. All right. The clothing line that's always been the apple of our eye, Matthew. Hey, well, you uh, you want to wear them all the time, except when you're eating applesauce. You don't want to spill anything oh, on your good collar applesauce. and elbow gear. Uh, available exclusively at collarandelbowbrand.com. Promo code Linda K gets you 10% off that you can just use to buy you some more applesauce. Collarandelbowbrand.com for all of apple your Apple picking is going to be a big thing in the next month or so. It's going to be that time of the season. You ever go to an apple orchard? Go on uh, apple rides? When I was in preschool, I think I went to an apple orchard and picked uh, picked apples. Now I just pick apples from the uh, a little plastic bag at my uh, in my grocery store. You know, I don't even go to the trouble of picking them out of the apple section. I just want them already bagged up and ready for me to grab and go. You like apples? How about these apples? All right, let's uh, let's get it into it. All right, first off, clash at the castle. It was Saturday afternoon uh, live on the Peacock Network. It was a network. Uh, what do they call it? A uh, it's a Peacock exclusive, or is a premium, premium live premium event? Premium live event. Mm -hmm. Good grief. The pay per view proper had one, two, three, four, five, six matches. They threw in a pre show match for us as everybody was filing into uh, the stadium in Cardiff. Over sixty thousand people there. Matthew, first off, what did you think of the set? Oh, I thought it looked. I thought it looked great. The only thing that, um, you know, I didn't like about it, and that's not the specific set. It's WWE production. The overuse of all the graphics that we've become accustomed to. Um, you know, occasionally they would basically scroll up to get a sweeping view of the stadium, and you're looking at a dragon on a castle. Like, no, give me the display. Give me what everybody in the arena has seen. I don't need to see a dragon in a castle in the the uh, the stadium. But my goodness, WWE. And I will say it is since the the triple rate the triple H triple rain, rated R superstar rain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Has started the lighting of those buildings looks so much better. What you could not do for I mean, basically, basically post COVID, you have not been able to see anybody in the upper levels. And if you watch a Raw, watch a SmackDown, especially this pay per view, yeah, you've still got some color lighting in the lower levels. You can tell the people there. You can actually see people, you know, in the 200 and the 300 levels. I thought it looked great. I thought it was well lit. And my goodness, uh, you could see all those people that you could hear all day long because that crowd was one of the best I've ever seen. It was an amazing thing. I didn't like the the stage itself. Now, the thing hanging over the ring, yeah, that looked awesome, right? You know, a nice little castle, whatever. But I didn't like the extremely long ramp, and it was basically them coming down a short little aisle Yeah, that was all lit up with video boards. Not a fan of it, but you know what? I understand, because they really did sell almost that entire building, so you couldn't take up, you know, 15,000, 20,000 seats just to make yourself a nice big stage. So I understand it. I completely yeah. do. I didn't mind it because I think it brought back memories of some garden shows where you've seen a similar setup. I didn't and like the garden shows though. Yeah, that, that, that and, setup is for the garden. That's it. Yeah. And it's like, you know what? I'll uh, I'll take it. 
because they've done that. Remember the edge return at the Royal Rumble or the big stadium shows that they do the Royal Rumble. It's a really poor looking stage. Actually, at SummerSlam at uh, Nissan Stadium this year, too, they had that really kind of blah, you know, yeah. stage. I like a big stage. I like a big WrestleMania stage where you can drive a tank on it. Well, there you go. All right. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the matches. Unannounced on the pre-show, Madcap Moss and the Street Profits defeating Theory and Alpha Academy. Uh, we'll get to PWR draft stuff tomorrow night uh, in our Raw breakdown. I will say real quick, though, before the show started, I, the team they call Meatheads, dropped Madcap, excuse me, dropped Madcap Moss for a, um, a competitor on the AEW pay-per-view because I didn't think he was announced for the show. Well, you know, I mean, you just you roll those dice sometimes, and sometimes it works out, and sometimes it doesn't work in your favor. Yeah, uh, Madcap Moss uh, picked up Claudio Castagnoli. So, well, hey, that's a pre-show win that I missed out on, but I got, you know, gimmick pay-per-view uh, specialty match points anyway. So, all right, uh, pre-show's out of the way. Let's go to the pay-per-view proper. Bailey, Dakota Kai, and EO Sky, the Disruptors. Defeating the Raw Women's Champion Bianca Belair, Alexa Bliss, and Asuka. We called it on this very program, PWR Today. Matthew, you said it specifically. Bailey will get the pin on Bianca Belair to set up a Raw Women's Championship feud. And that's precisely what happened. You knew this was going to be a hot crowd as soon as you heard them doing the uh, the little uh, the the Bailey song from the NXT days that you haven't heard in uh, mm. you know very very few WWE main roster arenas and they were off to the races with this but no uh foreseeably setting up that program between bailey and bianca and uh, i'm looking forward to it i think this is a real uh main event program we've got in store over the next few months surprise number one and again we get you know what wwe's been giving us tiny little tastes tiny little surprises surprise number one gunther was going to have a match with sheamus for the intercontinental championship but led to the ring by Ludwig, uh, Ludwig Kaiser and Matthew, who else? That was going to be um, our guy. From, uh, yes, you know, I didn't get the little freeze frame shot uh, yesterday, uh, but, you know, that's OK. I, I could could have done with that in the entrance, you know, get the little his little NXT gimmick there. But no, it was uh, a nice, a nice surprise. And the crowd loved it. So what that meant is Imperium. Obviously acknowledged from the NXT days, Imperium back to lead Gunther to victory and retaining the Intercontinental Championship against Sheamus. So you have the Brawling Brutes, the Imperium, nice little quote-unquote six-man, because they don't call trios in WWE, a six-man little interaction before the show started. You know what I really loved? That crowd in Cardiff gave the love to Sheamus after the match. Yeah, and uh, a crowd that really seemed to appreciate this match. This will be my match of the night without question. I thoroughly enjoyed this. They told a very, very physical uh, story. It was a lot of physicality in the match, but it was great storytelling as well. We'll get to it uh, in another recap of another show here in a few minutes. I think there was a company the following night that tried to replicate some of the praise that this match got um, yeah, it was physical. Yeah, Seamus got beat up, but it was a lot more than just two guys slapping each other's chest for five minutes. And uh, they told a great, great story. It's funny when you said slap a couple times, I heard um, uh, the water bug going, slap hands, slap hands. <laughs> <laughs> you say slap and chest, I'm thinking of, you know, uh, the water boy, <laughs> hey, water boy, Baba Boucher, slap and hands. I, and I want to say this, man. I mean, you go back to watch the stuff in NXT, but. There's nobody really that wrestles a style like Gunther now. And I mean, Seamus, Seamus, Seamus held there with him. And, uh, you know, I mean, it was uh, he was a really, really good person to have in there with a similar style. But my goodness, just the storytelling and just the style of a match you get in these matches. I think that guy's got that Intercontinental title for a while. So you're saying he's got it on lockdown? Isn't that what uh, you would have heard from Sami Zayn, you know, when he he's was dropping all that uh, verbiage? On a lockdown? But no, no, I don't know about lockdown, but he's got it on SmackDown. <laughs> <laughs> no, Sammy on Friday night when uh, he's talking about, like, yeah, 100. Fleet. You know, <laughs> Sammy was dropping all those different terms. Sammy, who I think is on my tag team of the Usos right now. <laughs> oh, boy. Sammy is not. Honorary <laughs> does not mean you're part of the team. 
Uh, just, just trying, you know. Well, it's, you know what? Let's talk about that. So if Sander, if Sammy's an USO and it's only up to three members for a team, that'll count. You better oh, pick oh. your three. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah. Oh, I, I didn't realize there was a limit. Okay, I thought you yeah, could just have yeah, a three. Yeah. Uh, I mean, because otherwise I would have drafted Inner Circle. I would have drafted the NWO, Black and White. <laughs> As the first pick in the 2023 fantasy draft, Matthew selects the WWE roster. <laughs> right, exactly. All right. Liv Morgan and Shayna Baszler for the SmackDown Women's Championship. Uh, in your words, you know, like when we were talking off air, a straight up match. Liv Morgan defeats and retains the Women's Championship. Yeah. And I mean, this story here was much of what we've seen with Liv prior to winning the title. And since she has won the title, you know, it's the underdog going against the odds. I will say it's probably the best Liv Morgan match that I've seen. I think she told a really good story with Shayna Baszler. And, you know, it was a it wasn't a 50 50 back and forth type of match. Shayna held the upper hand, the good portion of the match. And, uh, you know, Liv didn't. It wasn't a Hulk Hogan Hulk up at the end. I mean, everything within this match made sense. And uh, I think it was was effective in accomplishing exactly uh, what they wanted to. And the Liv Morgan title reign has it's interested me because I don't know. I did not personally feel like there was a huge groundswell for a Liv title reign. But it seems like as you listen to the crowds, I mean, the crowds are behind her. So it seems like it's a potential, uh, you know, a chance they've taken that, that might very well be paying off. Let me ask you a question. Did I miss this in the time that Shayna Baszler's been with the World Wrestling Entertainment? When has she been referred to as the uh, magician of submission? I love that name, but it's the first time I heard it. I think they're just freeing up the announce table and let them say what they want to say. <laughs> it's not bad. Um, not it's not bad at all. Edge and Rey Mysterio against the Judgment Day with uh, Dominic, Edge and Mysterio. And then you got Rhea Ripley over in the Judgment Day. Matthew, it's the first time we've heard. So in AEW, obviously, we've heard them sing in Jericho. You are beautiful on the inside. We hear him singing in Jungle Boy. Judy or no, Judy. Oh, my God. What's the <laughs> name of the what's the name of the Orange Cassidy song? It's uh, Jane, right? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Judy. They got him singing in uh, Jungle Boy's music. You've got him singing in, you know, all sorts of different songs. Edge got sung in. That is the yeah. first time I've heard a wrestling crowd sing Metalingus. Yeah. yeah. And that's what's so unprecedented about it. The other stuff you're accustomed to. The other stuff, it's kind of part of the deal. People are probably reading the lyrics as they're uh, – <coughs> before they're going to the shows. This I've never heard before, and this was absolutely outstanding. I loved it. And not just that, Meathead, the good couple of minutes – in between Edge's entrance and in between Judgment Day, you know, intro. And they held off, man. They held off to let that crowd absolutely repeatedly erupt for Edge. And I want to say one thing about this pay-per-view uh, from a few nights ago. I've never had this happen. Many times during this show, I would hear the pop and I would hear the roar of the crowd. And I'm looking for who's out of camera view that's going to rush the ring, that's going to be the surprise, that that type of pop, that type of murmuring that you normally get when there's murmur, an unexpected murmur, murmur, murmur. when there's an unexpected entrant, um, that was happening multiple times during the show, and it wasn't. It was just uh, it was just the them echo. so excited. Exactly, man. Um, but no, great great moment here. You know, and what a great crowd. You know, before off air as well, you know, this morning, I said, man, why am I failing? You know, I'm supposed to be the music guy for PWR today, right? I'm like, Alter Bridge is like two mega groups. It was like this group and that group. What is the group I'm missing? I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. Alter Bridge is Creed without that nut job, Scott Stapp. Yeah, Creed, Creed the band, not the guy from uh, The Office. No, 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 no. That guy was actually in a band, though, and he played at Woodstock. Really? I don't know. I knew that bit of information. Oh, yo, you need to dig into that. Creed Bratton is his real name. And uh, he played not the Mamas and the Papas, but uh, I'm, I'm spacing on the name. Look it up. Creed Bratton from yeah. The Office was actually in a folk band and played at Woodstock. That's outstanding. And, uh, you know, not that I need to, you know, lose my man card here, but I do listen to The Office Ladies with uh, Jenna Fisher and uh, uh, Angela um, Kenny. And, and, and uh, just to confirm, the original Woodstock, he wasn't at Woodstock 99 trying to burn a bunch of stuff down, right? He was the one that was invited by Miz. <laughs> <laughs> no, the original Woodstock in 69, not 94. 
I got you. 94 was the one that they did the 25th anniversary. And then 99, that was uh, Limp Bizkit trying to break stuff. Yeah, that was the uh, absolute chaos in 99. All right. So let's talk about it. Edge and Ray Mysterio defeat the Judgment Day. Dominic Mysterio not happy about how lovey-dovey Edge and Ray Mysterio are. Dominic kicked him so hard in the mommy-daddy button, he lost his shoe, got pissed, and took off his other shoe. And then clotheslined his father. And what an absolutely great looking clothesline too. Uh, yeah. You know, th- th- this was solid. And I think, I, you know what? The timing was right with the AE, the A and E special from uh, last week. You know, I just yeah. got me a nice little, nice little dose of the Mysterios and I was feeling nice and warm and, and fuzzy. And uh, then this happens. And uh, yeah, I, I'm very curious to see where Isn't this Isn't it goes. ironic though, that the edge of Mysterios were back to back. Yeah, yeah, no, it's very, very interesting. And I think we are forgetting the fact that Rey Mysterio did attack a woman during this match. Uh, He did. You know what I've also noticed? Rey Mysterio, since he's debuted, has never been in heel. (sighs) No, he hasn't, has he? And you're talking to WCW Meathead, so I know his entire history. Yeah, The filthy animals were not heels, okay? Yeah. I mean, that really... I mean that's a that's a that's run. That's thirty years of face. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, because the prototype, I mean, might have been a heel, but that's thirty years of being a fan favorite the entire time. My goodness. I mean, you know what's been longer? Well, actually, probably Mysterio, but PWR has been a fan favorite since nineteen ninety eight. So. Yeah, they they did have that brief heel run though. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, Dominic kicked him so hard his shoe fell off. And then he took off his other shoe, got so pissed off he clotheslined his father and then walked off and ripped his shirt, too. Um, so Dominic you know what? basically basically disrobing. Yeah, pretty much. In another country, too. I think that's child, and ba- uh, child endangerment from Ray. You know, I, I really, speaking of the A&E special, if we're getting heel Dominic, I want to hear – yeah, I, go, I go for it. I want to hear Dominic addressing, you know, basically being the, the subject of everything with him and Eddie, you know, when <laughs> he was five or six years old. I want to see Dominic reach deep and bring this up. What was the line from the do- uh, documentary? He was trying to, he's told to shake the ladder and he just can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shaking it. It won't move. All right. Um, WWE firing on all cylinders, and uh, we'll get to AEW in a little bit, but uh, the final two matches, Seth frickin' Rollins, or should I say, he's hot, he's spicy, he tastes great. Konnichiwa, Seth frickin' Rollins defeats Matt Riddle. Yeah, Seth Rollins is over wherever he goes. It doesn't matter how big of a dastardly heel you want to make him, my goodness. I mean, I think he is... He's as over as he's ever been in that company. You know, we got a connection with uh, the Fallen Angel. We need to talk to him and see if he can get us in contact with uh, Curry Man. Yeah, that would be a nice little. Uh, that'd be a nice little. Because Curry Man's got to be hot and spicy, and you know about what Seth Frickin' Rollins was wearing. Hey, Meathead, if he can't get us in touch with Curry Man, maybe he can get us in touch with Curry Head. Well, you never know. He was there, the one that was shaking the ring down when Daniel Bryanson invited everybody <laughs> into the ring. That's right. All right, the main event. Roman Reigns defeats Drew McIntyre to retain the undisputed WWE Universal Championship. Uh, it pains me to say this, Matthew Thomas. Linda K., I know you're listening. It pains me to say this. The Usos did make an appearance at the pay-per-view <laughs> clash at the castle. However, it's not the Usos that we were expecting, Jay and Jimmy. It was Solo Sukhoi saving the match. For Roman Reigns. Welcome to Team Nelson Mattella. That's right. There is always By accident. Room, room for you solo, and always glad to expand my one of two tag teams by another member. Due to the Judgment Day rule, which was uh, made clear to the accounting firm of Dewey Cheatham and Home, uh, the team they call Meatheads does have all three members now since Linda dropped Rhea Ripley. Due to the Judgment Day rule, Matthews, uh, Matthews Usos actually just added another member. Fantastic. Yes, they did. And uh, yeah, this match went uh, close to an hour. This was a long match. I was going to ask you, that was a long match. And what I liked was, uh, you know, the way the way this match was booked, we had uh, we had Drew going for his kick, uh, met with the spear, 
met with another spear. You kept thinking that was going to be the finish. Um, you know, was basically he was, you know, finally going to going to get it. And that was going to be the finish. But no, this was there was a lot of stuff going on at the end of the match and uh, a very, very enjoyable match there. And uh, again, I was surprised. I mean, with that crowd being what it was, you talk about a moment. Drew winning the title there. That would have been a historic WWE moment. And I'm looking it at it like, you know, uh, somebody in AEW winning in, in their hometown. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, which uh, also WWE's finish on Saturday may have actually kind of tipped the hat at, uh, okay, AEW saying, hey, if WWE is not going to do it, then we'll do it. If they're going to go left, we'll go right. Yeah, but my goodness, um, I, I, I guess Roman's not done holding that title, but... You know, if Drew's not taking it off of him, uh, you know, it makes you wonder who maybe somebody who's uh, Team Nelson Mandela's had uh, since the initial draft day might be the guy who takes it off of him. But uh, or maybe a returning cousin might uh, might be the one. But anyway, uh, very surprised here, Meathead. Did not think it was going to go this way, man. I thought this was Drew's match to win. The pay-per-view, very solid. I'm going to go back and watch it in a little more detail over the next week or so. Again, what a crazy holiday weekend we've got here. That's only half of our PWR Today report so far. We also have AEW's All Out. Um, Matthew, I said this also off air. This one I will say on air. I'm from Milwaukee, which is about an hour-ish away from Chicago. I've been born and raised to just really not be a fan of anything Chicago, right? Just, ugh. I don't want to hear it. Don't want to do it. I try not to spend any time down there. I have nothing against people in general, but I just am anti-Chicago. Okay. I see why now Chicago gets all these shows. You know, Milwaukee gets one dynamite slash rampage a year. You know, we had to go home for Forbidden Door this year, which ended up being a super hot show. They did not fail us at all. But AEW had how many shows this year already? At least five or six. And Chicago shows why exactly every time they should get more. Chicago is like uh, Daly's place number two. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's I'd say better than Daly's place, honestly. And oh, yeah. Yeah. I would say that Chicago has got to be home for AEW. I mean, they yeah. the fans yeah. literally show out, show up and prove to everybody in the entire wrestling world why Chicago gets these shows. No, without a doubt. And I mean, it was a solid, solid crowd. And uh, and with Punk being in the main event, I mean, yeah, we've had Punk in Chicago, but uh, we still to to we've have, already had that three times. Yeah. Punk in but Chicago. To, but to have a moment where he can actually he can actually be the challenger and potentially win the title. I think, you know, you got to do it, man. All right. Let's talk about the zero hour, which is probably the best pre-show name I've heard of yet. Zero Hour was actually pretty solid. It opens up with interview of uh, Sammy Guevara and uh, Ty Mello, and it leads into uh, Ortiz and Ruby Soho chasing him down in a golf cart, which starts off the match. This is for the AAA Intergender uh, Tag Team Championships, the winners and still champions, Sammy Guevara and uh, Ty Mello. Yeah, um, I think this was probably the way a lot of people expected this to go, um, but not a not a surprise to start at the, sh- the pre-show. Action Bronson, that is a name that uh, you need to keep an eye on. This dude looks like he was about seven to eight Coronas into a barbecue. That's Mm -hmm. my, this is not an insult, folks. This is a huge compliment. That's the kind of dude that I could see from the neighborhood hanging out with all night long. He is the guy who performs Hook's theme, uh, and he's ringside to watch Hook and Angelo Parker. After uh, Hook defeats Angelo Parker in about four minutes, one of Hook's longer matches uh, Matt Menard gets in the way, starts going after Hook. Uh, oh, my God. Action Bronson jumps in a ring, and this dude looks like he's ready to go. He's like AEW's Otis. So uh, what you're telling me is it's probably a good thing that Action Bronson was not driving the golf cart. Probably a good thing because he would have kept going. Dude, I love me some Action Bronson. Uh, like I said, the second I saw him, I'm like, Oh, hell yeah. That's a dude I'd be at a barbecue with right there. Like I said, he looked like he was seven Coronas in and it just got done, you know, helping uh, do a pig roast. And now he's just shooting bags and drinking with the boys at the end of the day. <laughs> That's my kind of guy right there. All right. All right. So now we get the all Atlantic championship. It's pack and he defeats Kip Sabian. Uh, my kids were very entertained with Kip Sabian arguing with a box. 
<laughs> I mean, hey, you got to have something for everybody. Well, they, they sold my kids. The final, the main event of the Zero Hour, Eddie Kingston defeats Tomohiro Ishii. This went 14 minutes on a pre-show. It's amazing that they did an hour and they did four solid matches. Yeah. You know, this was the one I alluded to earlier. This, the way it started specifically, my feeling was, okay, somebody saw the picture of Sheamus with his beat up chest that's making the rounds and we're going to try to one up that. And just not my cup of tea, the, the chops to start the match off for like three or four minutes straight, just, uh, I, I, I like let the job counter you. I was going to say, let me counter you on the one upping. AEW wasn't one upping the Kingston. And um, again, I'm sorry. Uh, Kingston and Ishii were not at one upping. This is the match. This is Japanese style. Yeah. This wasn't to one up them. This is exactly what they were going to do. If Sheamus and Gunther never happened, this was still going to happen. Yeah. You know, and this still probably just would not be my specific type of yeah. match, but you know, I'm sure there are many people out there who enjoyed it that have different tastes than I. And so, I mean, I will say, um, you know, outside of this and some spots in the main event, um, you know, I, th this was a there was something for my taste pretty much the entire show. Just this didn't happen to be it. OK, I love the uh, Casino Battle Royals or the Sonic the Hedgehog uh, hemorrhoid donut matches, mm -hmm. whatever they're calling them. This one. Wasn't doing it for me at the beginning. Yeah. Then it got really good, okay? Again, I've, I've mentioned this a bunch of times, Matthew. Uh, you'll concur or you'll disagree. But I don't agree with – if you're selling me – I don't want to say fake because fake's the wrong word. If you're selling me a staged, choreographed fighting scenario and the, the prize – they said this initially – this match could be over before all the competitors yeah, come out. Yeah. So why are the first two not trying to run up the ladder? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Does, Multiple does times, sense. the guys are just staring at each other. Andrade and Roosh staring at each other. They're not going up the ladder. And then you got uh, my guy, Claudio, who I just picked up, doing this intricate scissoring thing with the ladder, which we'll see scissoring later. But um, the match got good, you know, great spots. I just I struggle a little bit sometimes with the rules in AEW and putting these intricate matches together. All right. So we at the end of this match still don't know who the Joker is because at number eight, the lights go out. Let me take that back. I believe, well, the lights didn't go out for that part. It was the black hoods, right? It was the guys in the sweat jackets and the black hoods. Yeah. We, we had that prior to the Joker being announced. We had That's them right. storm the ring, yep. That's right. All right. Someone goes up to the top ladder, takes down the, uh, this time it's a casino chip. It's Stokely Hathaway. All the other gentlemen that are wearing the black jackets and hoods are all the people he gave cards to. Who did he give cards to? Ethan Page, the Ass Boys, Big Cass, otherwise known as W. Morrissey. And they all walk off. Because now someone with a white devil mask on, comes down and takes the chip. Matthew Thomas, I popped harder than I've popped in a long time for music and yep. wrestling because I'm not a big Rolling Stones fan. But there is one song, and it's that song. So please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man with wealth and taste. You know why I really love that song more than anything else? At the end, he goes, mm, meathead. That's right, that's right. Here's what I thought was so great about it. You have the anticipation, you have the build up, and there is the way the song the way the song kicks off. There is a build up to the actual vocal. You are probably yes. 45 to 45 to 50 seconds before you get any vocal, and it's a lot of background music as you build up to the song actually hitting in. And uh, I thought it was absolutely the right choice for uh, what we got here. Hey, um, I want you folks that listen to this program, after you're done listening to this, I want you to listen to Sympathy for the Devil by the Rolling Stones. And I want you to tell me, what's the chorus? A lot of songs, you know, 70, 80 yeah. years, all have a formula. Verse one, verse two, chorus, interlude, chorus, out. Tell me what the chorus is from Sympathy for the Devil. There's articles out there that say that's probably the most unique song of all time because you can't define it. You can't define it at all. So 
Matthew, what do you think the chorus is of that song? You know what? I got to go back and, and deconstruct it now because uh, I don't know that I know the answer to that. There isn't. So go and look it up. All right. The winner of the match is uh, the the Joker, the person under the mask. And he was about to show us, and then he doesn't. Let's get over to the Trios World Title Championship match. It's going to be Don Callis on commentary with the elites, Kenny Omega, Matt Jackson, and Nick Jackson with Brandon Cutler and Michael Nakazawa defeating the Dark Order's Hangman Page and Alex Reynolds and John Silver, uh, Johnny Hungy, the Meat Man. Your thoughts on the winners and new Trios champions. I thought the false finishes in this match were absolutely great. Um, not your traditional kicking out of a finisher, another finisher, false finish. These were multiple spots where you think, okay, this is how it's going to end. This makes sense. And nope, uh, false finish. I thought this was a really, really well done, um, you know, sequence to end this match. And uh, yeah, we got a, I I think we're going back to potentially kind of loner hangman because uh, things didn't seem to work out too well with the Dark Order here. Well, I'll tell you what, Hangman, now a member of the team they call Meatheads after I have dropped Ezekiel slash uh, Elias slash Elrod. So Hangman, even though he didn't win the titles, now a member of the team they call Meatheads. So he's winning in life, at least. Absolutely. And I mean, just in time for me to pick up uh, the family of Ezekiel for the Royal Rumble when uh, he appears (laughs) at least three times. Fair enough. Well, you only get one appearance anyway, so. All right, uh, we're going FTR, which uh, I think I saw War TR. Mm, Did I see a sign that said War TR? Yeah, very that possible. was not bad. Dax Hardwood, Cash Wheeler, they defeat Jay Lethal in the Motor City Machine Guns. Motor City. Alex Shelley and Chris Saban with Sanjay Dunn and Satnam Singh. Uh, getting the pinfall was an eight-year-old girl, which is obviously uh, Dax's uh, daughter. Absolutely. And somewhere in an alternate universe where time travel is a possibility, she is currently in a program with a young Dominic Mysterio. Possibly. Powerhouse Hobbs, Ricky Starks. Hobbs blowing right through Ricky Starks. Yeah, surprised here. I mean, I, you know, I mean, Hobbs, yeah, he's, uh, you know, he's he's promoted as this unstoppable guy. But I was thinking we were going to see a little a uh, little more from from Starks here, but uh, was not to be. The Tag Team Championship, Swerve in Our Glory, a member of the team they call me dead, Swerve Strickland and Keith Lee, defeat the acclaimed uh, with uh, Daddy Ass, Chicago. Again, uh, I may say that I want nothing to do with you. I may say that uh, I want nothing to do with anything Chicago-related sports-wise, but you guys rocked it. Scissor me, Daddy. Wow. This This match uh, and this crowd. You know, this... This might have actually stolen the show for me. I think it's match of the night. To be honest. Yeah, this this might have been my match of the night. I mean, the actual story they told in ring, but also the fact that you knew the acclaim were over, but I don't think you knew exactly how over until last night. And I'm glad they didn't pull the trigger here because the crowd would have absolutely loved it. But And then turned I, on them after. I think... I think having just your, you know, average viewer watching this, I think this is going to get the acclaim over so much more at your weekly dynamites, at your weekly rampages, at your next pay-per-views, and I think now there is going to be that groundswell for the acclaim as tag team champions that people would have liked to have seen them win last night, but I don't think there was that big uprising like you're potentially going to have. They've they've got something really really good here and the cool thing is I mean, this feels like a, uh, I mean, this feels like a homegrown uh, AEW talent here. And I think we need more time for that storyline with Keith Lee and Swerve to develop because it does not seem like they've had those titles for long. And I think eventually, yeah, we're going to them breaking up. We're going to go, you know, to those guys as singles competitors, but we need to let that kind of, kind of percolate for a little while. You want to let it simmer. And, you know, honestly, the Keith Lee and Swerve thing is more like a Kobe and Shaq type deal where they get along, they win, but maybe maybe there'll be something down the road for them. And at the end, you know, face teams do what face teams do. Um, Keith Lee is scissoring Billy Gunn. Absolutely. And, I mean, who doesn't want to see that? Scissor me, daddy ass. And that shirt now is uh, officially available. I think they said that was the uh, 
that was the hottest uh, shirt on AEW.com. Yeah, was. Com, and my goodness, I can't blame them one bit. Leo Lee and Billy scissored, and the crowd didn't like it. What is wrong with you, Chicago? Beathead, you know, you know, when I come to the uh, to the Brett show the end of October, I think that. By the way, did you see the update on that? I did. More talent announced. Uh, somebody that was in a match from a, a couple matches ago. Right. And uh, but I think that's going to be my that's going to be my flying shirt. I think I'm going to fly, go walk to the airport, and, and fly in that shirt. You're going to get on a plane with a shirt that says "Scissor Me, Daddy Ass." Absolutely. Then you're gonna meet your mom with that shirt on. <laughs> yes. Okay. The AEW Women's World Championship. Uh, it's a four-way: Tony Storm, Dr. Britt Baker, DNT, Jamie Hader, and Nakaro Shida. Shida told a story about getting hurt, came back with more candlesticks. Was there no DQ in this match? Uh, four people involved, probably not. Uh, AEW again. The rules, man. Uh, come on with the rules. There's more later. We'll get to it. But uh, the winner and new interim women's champion, Tony Storm. Nobody had Tony. Nobody picked her up. Oh, Linda did, though, right? Did she? Linda, I believe, picked up Tony Storm. Well, Linda K., look at you. Tony Storm with a title win for you. All right. I predicted it was Jamie Hayter. I really felt Jamie Hayter. She was looking good. New outfit, the whole works, but it was Tony Storm. Well, here's the good thing, though. I think we may have something even better. I think we are finally getting that potential program between Jamie and Britt, and that is a non-title women's program that AEW sorely needs. And you got whatever, uh, whoever the contender for Tony's going to be, and then you've eventually got the built-in story with uh, Thunder Rosa coming back. Before the match, Jungle Boy's mom gave Christian a slap at ringside. Um, Jack Perry definitely got his mom's hair, and so did his sister. Because, yeah. you know, when I think back to Luke, Luke always had that kind of short, straight yeah. hair. Yeah. But, boy, they've got some wild-ass hair, which is okay. It's a good look for him. Um, Jungle Boy was billed as Jungle Boy Jack Perry. And, again, you know, some JR did a few years ago, something you've talked about for a long time. He's being built as Jack Perry, the Jungle yeah. Boy Jack Perry. But during the entrance – Luchasaurus, who Jack Perry is looking for on the face tunnel, attacks him from the heel tunnel and lands him on the pyro uh, grids. They made a great point about it. Look at Jack's yeah. back. Those grids, even though, you know, that it wasn't going off at that time, those grids are still hot yeah. from all the pyro going through it. It left little marks up and down his back. Absolutely. And I think they really got us a step closer to us getting Jack Perry and not Jungle Boy because what cost him this match was he was still trying to be Jungle Boy. He was waiting for his life-size dinosaur to come to his side, and that is ultimately what caught him off guard and cost him this match. So, I mean, Christian, I hope he's going to explain to us on Wednesday that he told him to you know, kind of lie to Jack Perry the whole time because, I mean, back and forth, back and forth. I hope that's the case. Give me some explanation. Yeah, and it was uh, – I mean I was kind of intrigued by heel Luchasaurus, and then it just – it felt strange when he just jumped ship back to uh, back to Jungle Boy. So hopefully we do get the explanation. And you know, if there's anybody good at giving that evil bad guy – Here was what I was doing all along. It's Christian in a turtleneck. Yep, it's Christian in a turtleneck. That's the whole thing. Uh, so after the pounding, Jack uh, Perry answered the bell, but he lost in 33 seconds due to a spear and then the kill switch. Uh, Death Triangle and Best Friends is announced for next week uh, to be trios match there. Pac continues to dog Orange Cassidy. Oh, you hate, hate to see that. Can't they just get along? Right, because you got to give the people what they want. Chris Jericho defeats Brian Danielson. This is a bit of a shock to me. Yeah, um, you know, and it was done. I mean, it was a very, very technical match until the finish. And I think that you're probably playing a little bit more into – Sports entertainer versus wrestler, you know, with the low blow finish into, uh, you know, into the actual elbow to finish the match. But, uh, yeah, and I'm, I applaud them for, you know, going this route as opposed to this. This could have also been a much, much different, more gruesome match here. Let me ask you a question. The music that Jericho came out to, can you name it? You know I can, but I want to know yeah. if you're going to. Yeah, I, I, know, I know the song, but I can't name it. Okay, so who's the band? If you know the song, who is it? Um, it is going to be the the B-52s, I believe. Yes. Good God, man. <laughs> <laughs> that is Chris Jericho coming out to 
I just set up yours, baby. Do, 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 do. That is White Zombie. Electric Head Part 2. I prefer they come out to White Snake, but... In the still of the night? Absolutely. You ever hear Coverdale Page? I'm not familiar, no. So the leader of White Snake is David Coverdale. And uh, he did an album with Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin. Ooh. They had two big radio hits. Shake My Tree and... Um, uh, shake my tree, and uh, there was another one. I can't think of the top of my head, but uh, go look it up. Coverdale Jimmy, Page. Jimmy Page also with some good work uh, with the Black Crows on several uh, several albums. Again, uh, we're gonna have a talk after the show, Matthew, because you uh, you're embarrassing PWR and its music background. Oh, you gotta you gotta love you some Black Crows, man. Come on. Darby Allen, Sting, and Miro defeating the House of Black, Malachi Black, Brody King, and Buddy Matthews. Um, Hey, you did you what? see what I did there? I just brought up a band that had crows in the title, and then you talked That's about right. Sting. <laughs> That's right. And Black. The House of Black. Yes. Oh, my goodness. That it's was called just... called Segway City. All uh, right. Absolutely. And Sting looked good. Sting with the Black Mist at the end of the match. Was it Black Mist, or was it tobacco he spit in his eye? Honestly, it was probably Grandpa Tobacco. <laughs> probably what it was. He probably was doing a little bit of dip out on the porch, whittling a, a you know, a, <laughs> making a knife. Well, how else did he make a knife? What another knife? <laughs> uh, not a bad match. Your feelings? Yeah, no, I, I uh, thought it was thought it was enjoyable. Um, you know, we I was surprised. I I thought Miro would be featured in the finish, but uh, you know, I mean, it's pretty. Recurring theme that, you know, Sting's going to factor prominently in the finish of this match. But, uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, solid. I think it was it was put in the right spot here in the show. Yeah. You ready for the main event? Oh, absolutely. The AEW World Championship, CM Punk and John Moxley. When they were getting ready to bring out CM Punk, they showed Moxley warming up in the background again. Come on. Be better at production. Let's oh, go. my goodness. You saw it, right? Yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, the crowd was so hot. So, so hot. So, so, near falls, all but, over the place. But not as anti-Moxley as you thought they would be. Right. Remember, there's not that far a distance between Cincinnati and Chicago. That can be driven. Yeah. Well, I mean, our own Linda K drives Milwaukee to, say, Louisville, you know, to go down to OV Dub. So, I mean, we're only talking a difference of an hour. That's a good. That's a good point. All right. Well, Chicago, again, one more time. I'm done kissing your ass, but you really showed up and showed out in this pay-per-view. This match, which I thought I was scared that it was going to go the opposite way of Dynamite, with CM Punk hitting the go-to-sleep right away and yeah. then trying to pin Moxley. I'm like, oh, my God, no, no. Yeah. What time is it? Oh, yeah, that's okay. Woof. I literally looked at the clock to see what time it was when I saw yeah. that. And, you know, you've also got the start of the pay-per-view hanging out there and that little uh, casino chip. It's never been presented like a Money in the Bank briefcase. But, you know, that's also in the back of your mind. You know, could this be could this be a really quick match and we get whoever was under that mask come out? So I think they were kind of teasing that as well, too. Who do you think was under the mask, uh, Matthew? Um, so uh, first thought was Karrion Cross. Second oh, thought boy. was Christopher Daniels, my favorite, oh, boy. my favorite. And this was what I ultimately settled on, OK? And I was able to make sense of the title match from Dynamite a few weeks ago was the fact that Punk got beat so quick. He's lost confidence. He doesn't think he can win. He's aligning himself with Stokely Hathaway. And yes, that was Punk that came out uh, in God. the mask. And what was going to happen, okay, you were going to have another similar match to what you had on Dynamite. Moxley was going to win very, very quick and decisively. Then all of Hathaway's people were going to hit, and you were going to find out that Punk was under the mask the entire time. And a team Nelson Mandela would not only get a title win, they would get a specialty match win and a uh, cash-in of a poker chip. <laughs> yeah, no. All right, so we know how great this particular match was. Punk hits a second go to sleep, regains the championship, a title win for CM Punk. The lights hit, and they hear these voicemails, and it's Tony Khan saying, look, you know what? Let's just end this. I won't extend you. I'll pay you this much. I'll put you in the match. Uh-oh. Is it, is it going to be? Is it, is it going to be? Michael, Juliet, Foxtrot. MJF. 
Matthew, I'm going to do it one more time. I know I said I'm done kissing Chicago's ass. That pop. Yeah. When the scarf went on the neck, which was chef's kiss. Perfect. When his music oh. hit in the arena, perfect. And when he came out, perfect. Outstanding. And if you did not realize what a star he is, I think you realized it last night. I mean, that was that was a punk level pop in Chicago media. For not punk. For not punk. Yep. Yeah, make that part clear. That was not for punk. And okay. uh yeah, I think we got we got a hot storyline and we got a we potentially got a new hottest star in the company right now. Matthew, we're at 40 some minutes plus already. I've got to ask the burning question. Now that we've gone over everything that's happened, let me ask you this. And this I want you to extrapolate and I want you to stretch it out and really explain it to me. A was this hot shot booking and this is how we made it work or B is this long storm telly? Uh, long, long term storytelling. Sorry, I'm so excited I can't even get yeah. the words out. What the MJF? Did we do long, uh, long term storytelling, or did we hot shot and get him back? Uh, I, I'm gonna err on the side of long term storytelling. Now that does not explain what we got a few weeks ago with Moxley and Punk, and where we've been at, you know, with everything in between there. But I, I think that this was. Uh, yeah, I think that this was probably planned. And I got to go back to the Dynamites and the Rampages that we've seen. Go back and watch the the last few months worth and how often we see those. Where can we see up. those, to be honest? You say go back and watch them. Uh, your Where DVR. The are they? You, just, uh, oh. you just can't delete them off of your DVR or your TV okay. or your yeah. VCR or, or DVR or DVD recorder. Thanks. So go back in the past and I'll, I'll stop <laughs> it from deleting. Right. If you've got a time machine, uh, you, could, you can do that. Um, yeah, you got that. You got those options, and uh, it depends on your cable outlet. You know, if you got some A and E AEW on demand content, you can try to find it on A and E, but uh, you, you'll find some good WWE documentaries, but not A and you won't find AEW on A and E. Do you think that Tony Khan and AEW did long term storytelling with us, and they set us up? I'm okay either way. I just want to know. Yeah, for for the punk for the uh, for the MJF thing, I do. Um, you know, like I said. Only, only speaking to MJF, everything with Punk and Moxley, I'm still uh, befuddled on it because I don't think that that was, if there was supposed to be a payoff with, uh, you know, with what we got a couple of weeks ago and the way that, you know, everything went with Punk and Hangman, uh, you know, with the, the off the cuff comments. No, none of that. I, I don't think that's any long uh, term type of deal, but I think the whole MJF thing from the promo to not mention him for a couple of months uh, to bringing him back in Chicago, I think that was the plan. Did MJF and Stokely Hathaway make a new pinnacle? So here's the thing, and it's possible, but I hope not. I would be much more content if MJF just used that business arrangement for last night and okay. MJF operates as MJF because I thought it was very interesting. Uh, he was not flanked by any of them. And uh, I don't know, it doesn't, and, and I may see it on Wednesday and be completely wrong, but MJF jumping back into another stable, especially jumping into a stable, uh, you know, with, with Stokely Hathaway's group, it just doesn't, it, that doesn't land that great with me just in an elevator speech, just right off the cuff. I may see it and love it, but I think especially with that reception that we saw, I think MJF needs to be MJF. Okay. Last question. Does MJF get his title shot at AEW Grand Slam? Absolutely. Is that when it happens and he wins it? <sighs> I don't know if he wins it there, um, but, you know, that's getting close to his neck of the woods, right? Well, full gear is also around his In neck Newark. of the woods. Yeah, yeah. So I would rather, me personally, I'd like to see the punk reign last a little bit longer. And here's the thing. I know MJF is MJF, and he's the character that everybody knows as MJF. But I'm not so sure that by the time you get to... Uh, full gear we haven't had a double turn hmm. because i just don't know 
I don't know with that reception. I mean, Punk's been Punk's been teetering, man. Punk's been teetering, you know, that kind of that fine line between heel and face. I mean, Punk could I thought you were going to say it. between love and hate and involve Angela Bassett. Or literally a teeter-totter or seesaw. Maybe he's, you know, doing that as well, too. But I just wonder if MJF is so hot right now that all the cheap heat he tries to get from wherever he's at just doesn't work. And you just have to synergistically go with this guy who's the number one star in your company. Mm -hmm. Synergistically. On that word, we're going to end the show. Folks, we will have results from the PWR Today Fantasy Draft for 22-23. Um, lots of movement, lots of shaking, lots of title wins, lots of title defenses, lots of title losses. We've got points going all over the place. Skeet, skeet, skeet. We're shooting points everywhere. So we'll talk to the accounting firm of Dewey Cheatham and how it was such a big weekend. It can't be done in one day. It's, we're going to have to take a couple days to go over these points. Theory apparently tried to cash in at the clash that I didn't even see. I must have turned my head while I was trying to make brats or something. I have no idea. I mean, all these shows over and over and over. So... <laughs> Tomorrow, I believe Linda Kay is joining me for the Raw recap, and we will get to the PWR Fantasy Point drafts, uh, draft points at that point. So for Matthew Thomas, for Linda Kay, the man they call me did, we will talk to you tomorrow morning. So long, everyone.